All right, um, hello everyone. Welcome uh, to this workshop. Um, my name is Julia Schütze um, and with me is uh, Kate Zaslow. Um, and yeah, we would like to do a workshop with you today. So we'll be a little bit interactive um, as well. So I think at some point you might wanna get closer um, to, the, to the stage. Um, our topic today is human rights-centered uh, cybersecurity training. Uh, when we set up this workshop um, in our work um, on, at a think tank, we, we work on international cybersecurity policy, and there is a lot of concentration on cybersecurity of the state. Um, however, states are using cyberspace also for a lot of different reasons, to have uh, different foreign policy and security goals that are not necessarily good for IT security of people, citizens, um, and may also use surveillance tactics. So um, this workshop will really want to concentrate on cybersecurity of the people. Um, we have basically three goals. So one I already said, we really want to focus on safety and security. And for some people, you would maybe use more the, um, the word uh, digital security instead of cyber security of people um, and shifting away from this national security focus. Um, then we really want to increase awareness about to achieve this. We do have to look at specific cases. We do have to look at individual situations. Um, and take into account their threat landscape. So we will um, have a case you already have in front of um, that uh, we will uh, work through. 
um, and then really identify some challenges and some best practices on how to work in um, kind of an insecure environment, in a challenging environment um, together. And we will do this from different perspectives. So we will have um, people here on stage who will start with an input before you guys can chim in and, and help us um, deal with these challenges, uh, who work on, on global development, but also work on IT security specifically, incident response, who are um, journalists. So uh, to really get at this problem, you have to look at all these different perspectives. And we hope that you obviously bring in uh, even more perspectives um, to this case. So the agenda for the next 90 minutes, um, the introduction is nearly done. Um, then I'm handing over um, the stage to um, Daniel Mosbrucker. Daniel Mosbrucker is um, a journalist. He's also a digital security trainer. He uh, worked at Reporter Without Borders. Um, and he also does his PhD specifically looking at what uh, impact does surveillance have on, on journalism? And for what he's here today, he um, developed um, a threat modeling guide for project managers who work specifically in development context, who really need to identify on a non-technical level, first of all, what are even the threats. And um, he brought here um, a case for us to work on. Um, and yeah, with that, I'm handing it over to uh, Daniel to explain a little bit better <laughs> on what the case is about. Cool. Yeah. Um, yeah. Thank you, Julia, for this nice introduction. Thanks for um, having me, and also thanks for having um, Deutsche Welle Academy uh, today um, to present this use case you all uh, will work on, um, luckily, in the next 90 minutes. Uh, DW Academy is part of uh, the broadcaster um, DW and DW Academy strengthens uh, media freedom and media independence in more than 50 countries with a focus on Africa and Asia. And I am part of a project there as a consultant uh, in which we try to deal with digital security threats and try to more work because there are a lot of trainings out there. Some people in the development countries, but also uh, in, in, in countries like Germany, um, are already complaining that they are overtrained in digital security. So they had a lot of trainings, but they don't really change their behavior. And that's specifically the focus we're trying to address in our project. So okay, what are like the more strategic and structural changes um, that need to, need to be done? And um, one part of this was this uh, development of the um, of a, yeah, an interactive guide for civil society organization and project managers working on it. It's not yet published. Uh, it is in the layout. So I'm done with the work. It's in the layout now. If you want uh, to receive it, it will be published um, digitally. Um, please just write me informally an email. Uh, with, I don't know, subject line IGF, or I don't know, I just put you in a folder and we'll let you know. Uh, once we're out, um, this is already the, the headline. Um, so yeah, please uh, let me know if you're interested. This from our project, and for that project, we did a lot of research. Um, and of course, DW Academy is also quite experienced when it comes to digital security threats. Uh, and what I brought today is a quite of this, this stereotype example um, uh, yeah, organizations like the W Academy, uh, but also others have to work with. So um, the case scenario for today um, is the following. Um, you have a situation in which you have a funding entity uh, that does not care much more than about just giving money. Giving money to a development corporation organization. Um, and this development corporation um, sets up a project, have a, has a project plan, um, and in our example, um, the project is setting up a digital human rights lab um, in a country of the Global South, working together with local partners. This is quite um, common that it's like that, yet you have a development corporation basically uh, giving um, money and, um, yeah, sharing knowledge and working always with local partners to strengthen these local partners. And the interesting challenge is that, um, this will follow soon, but we will see it here already, we have a situation from a security perspective in which we still have at least four different entities, 
but they like on a regular basis, which means every day they work together. So they remain uh, in their organizations, but they have like a temporarily uh, environment to create in which they can communicate and work safety. Um, so a need is this temporary IT only for the project, while all organizations have their own in IT infrastructure already. Everybody remains individual, but they have to work together in a secu secure way. Um, and the challenges, challenges we are facing is that the funding organization, this is what was here, the, now the, um, the blue one, um, the funding organization is a big entity with uh, 1,000 plus employees. So everybody who's working in such a, such a big uh, entity knows that it's kind of slow sometimes and there are a lot of, um, a lot of rules um, and of course this organization has its own IT, IT department and a change of the uh, IT infrastructure is, is just always an issue. It's possible but it is an issue. You have to lobby for it internally and it just takes time. Uh, plus, uh, when we're looking now into the project, um, every adoption of a, let's say, foreign entity, for example, the local partners, um, can be considered as a security risk. So the IT department will never ever say, yeah, 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 just leave them in. Uh, because for the uh, funding organization, this is, of course, can be considered as a security risk. Um, and why don't they let them in? Um, because the local NGOs, um, do have several structural um, problems. Um, first of all, um, mostly they don't even have an IT department because they're like small organizations, 20, 30 uh, people as a maximum. Or they have like, if there's a real need, I don't know, the mail server is not running anymore, then they hire uh, on an hour basis a freelancer who does this for them. But like not the strategic planning of IT. Secondly, um, due to limit resources and of course due to practi um, practicability, um, they mostly rely on free services like Google Drive, Slack, WhatsApp, Gmail, all the other things that are just, at least when it comes to money for free. Um, yeah. And uh, number three, um, the awareness is relatively low. While I have to admit this is mostly true for all the employees, not only in the local NGOs. Um, right. So what is the, for our case now, the risk matrix? So the need is that we'll get a, a temporary IT for the project that, that works. And of course, this is quite a big thing. It takes, in, when I do these um, projects, it takes like weeks to make a real threat modeling process. But for our workshop, we kind of um, narrow it down a little bit. So the risk matrix could look um, as follows. The assets um, are five ones, so we need to secure the communication within the team uh, and with the external partners. Partners, I mean like the local NGOs. Um, internet research in terms of online behavior, so everything we'll do on our computer, on our smartphone while like researching. Project data stored uh, and edited, uh, probably in a cloud because we have a temporary project running. Um, bank account data for project related uh, transaction and um, the physical integrity of devices like smartphones. And these assets are at risk, are at risk because we do have certain adversaries uh, which can be grouped as follows. Uh, we have government related agencies of the country of the global south. We do not consider here agencies of the funding country because as they are funding, they probably, if they want to know what's going on, they probably just ask. Um, the ISPs uh, of the organizations, speaking on, for all the techies here in the room, speaking of the IP layer. Um, third party services like Google or Facebook, speaking of more about the application layer. And we do have like relatively, compared to these others, relatively low sophisticated online criminals who are just interested in, I don't know, hacking your bank accounts and making some money. Right, um, this might seem now quite complex, I think uh, it is, <laughs> but uh, Julia uh, thankfully has printed um, this case. Um, so, and on a sheet of paper, I think, yeah. 
uh, and uh, we will um, distribute it. Um, and yeah, thanks for the attention for now, and um, thanks already now for your input. Um, I, I'm very sure that it, this will help us a lot. Thank you. Um, yeah, the case studies are actually already printed in front of you, and if someone doesn't have one sitting in front of them, come find us because we have more up here. Um, we, as you can see, invited different speakers. They all come from different professional backgrounds and have had different experiences with a probably similar case to what Daniel just presented. Um, each of them have prepared a unique challenge and a solution uh, to this case or to potential problems with digital rights, oh, sorry, um, such as freedom of expression or privacy. And these solutions that they'll present can be kept in mind as a best practice, which you can use during the brainstorming session, um, which will follow, I'll tell you more then. Um, and the goal of these best practices, or the goal of their solutions, is to foster and protect rights such as right to freedom of expression and right to privacy. Um, so without further ado, I'll give the stage to our first speaker, Farhan Janjua. He is a... Um, digital rights practitioner, is journalist, consultant, and he also does security trainings. Yes. It is only one page. We'll discuss it more during the brainstorming session, so if you have any questions. Oh, okay. It's a one page. Yeah, it's a one pager, though. You're not missing a second page. Oh, it, it says the following challenge is just this, and there's just one one, so question two. Ah. So. Is there something? Okay. Well, we'll yeah. If there are questions, we can elaborate during the during the session. Thank you. Um, hi everyone. I'm Farhan Janjua. Uh, thank you for the introduction. And um, um, so I've already um, considering the the case in point which you already have in front of you. I try to identify some of the challenges given the context that I come from. So I'm a Pakistani journalist. I um, work with uh, local journalists and activists and also um, organizations. So when I looked at the challenge, I had some ideas that, um, that are extremely relevant to the challenge. And I will list them down and hopefully would try to think of solutions from my point of view. Um, so the first one is the trust deficiency. So when it comes to the NGOs or the funding bodies or the international NGOs, it's, um, it's, uh, it, there really is a lack of trust in, 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 in countries like, uh, like ours. Um, also thanks to some of the pretty big scandals that we've had concerning the INGOs, international NGOs. Um, so the first uh, challenge in this is that um, the uh, local partners that you would be working with would come up to you and would ask you, okay, how should we trust you and your uh, proprietary software and IT infrastructure? Are you really telling us that you are more secure than Google? Um, so really, uh, this, this, you, would, you would need some work with them and you would need some convincing. And uh, so uh, really two scandals that I would like to quickly highlight that took place in Pakistan. One was when they tried to catch Osama bin Laden. And even though they were successful, but they, the method that they used was this um, uh, the polio vaccine drive uh, led by an NGO, and then the whole infrastructure was involved, and that ended up jeopardizing um, the whole uh, polio program in the country, and it really became like a health uh, scandal. Um, and then another one was this uh, executive from the Save, from Save the Children NGO, so he really had access to some of the uh, data that he shouldn't have had. And he, he, so he now is being uh, charged with uh, molesting like 30 plus children. Um, so now after all this scandal and being like, you know, a media um, scandal everywhere, there's really a lack of deficiency when it comes to the trust. So um, people locally, they also, this, this is uh, really true also for the, for the people who work with NGOs, uh, who really want to uh, make, a, make a difference and change something, but uh, are hesitant when it comes to introduction of uh, new IT all of a sudden, because they would be like, okay, why can't we just use, continue using our Google Mail or Slack or whatever? So the, this is one of the challenges that I ident identified. Um, the next would be, even if you convince them that, um, okay, maybe we, we should, we have the custom email services, for example, or the, or the proprietary software, 
um, unique to every organization, and uh, then there's lack of training when it comes to um, the local organizations and the staffers that, that work there. Um, that's another uh, challenge that I identified. And then really there's also um, the lack of awareness why the privacy matters, because um, it, it uh, is usually followed by um, something like, you know, we have nothing to hide, so why, why should we encrypt our communication and why should we, uh, you know, yeah, and this, this is really a challenge because when you, when you hear statements like this coming from really uh, progressive or liberal uh, political leaders and then you, you know, you really end up banging your head against the walls because, okay, if, if, the, if the progressive people are saying this, the, there's no, there's no uh, hope really. So uh, then yeah, that's another thing because they would be like, ah, maybe something fishy is going on. Why are they asking us to encrypt or hide our communication? What, what do they want us to do? So yeah, that's another um, issue. And then of course the um, lack of secure communication devices uh, given the attitude uh, also among the activists and journalists and the people who work with uh, these organizations, they um, often end up having um, un uh, unsecure devices uh, and it's really um, because of the, of the context that I mentioned before. Um, so given these points, I would like to also mention um, some solutions that I propose. Yes. Um, so for the first one, I propose that um, unless it's a really, really sensitive uh, project and you really, and maybe the big organizations such as Google or Slack uh, could really be one of your adversaries, I think you should find a way, we, we should find a way to make, make do with uh, some of these existing um, tools, although I'm pretty sure uh, Daniel might disagree with me. Um, but I think that uh, if uh, given the limited resources and, um, you know, uh, uh, yeah, uh, as I said, unless the, the project deals with really sensitive information and you really can't trust Google for that and then you can focus on uh, developing really your own infrastructure. Um, uh, moving on to the next point, um, you, uh, I think the, the big organizations, uh, as my colleague mentioned, uh, or including the donor uh, organizations that may be based in the so-called global north, and uh, so and uh, if they, they have a lot of data to protect, then they really have to find a way to give the access to the, to the um, NGOs that work on site in these uh, uh, countries using that data. And I think one of the ways um, could be to creating sort of uh, APIs, um, uh, 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 and through those APIs, they could only uh, find uh, a way to uh, give access to only limited amount of data that is really necessary for, for the projects. Um, the next uh, solution that I propose would be, uh, of course, the uh, concerns the training, because we really need more um, workshops and trainings as to why privacy matters. I mean, we are, we are really uh, talking about super absolute beginning, and uh, sometimes yeah, it makes sense when you when you tell them that yes, it matters. And uh, so how I try to do it, um, I give them an example that how would you feel if you uh, were sharing um, absolute and intimate um, chats, messages uh, with somebody, and uh, some and this this third individual who you do, who barely who you don't even know has access to all that, including your intimate photos and something. And then they are like, oh yeah, that's uh, that's yeah, we wouldn't like our nudes. Um, ending up in wrong hands. So then, I, yeah, it's not really the best example, but this is, I mean, we work with what we can work with. Um, so yeah, I think the training, we need more of those uh, trainings. Um, and then uh, 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 we, we can also focus on individual trainings depending on the, um, the, uh, the certain needs of the, of the project. Um, because obviously depending on the project and then depending on the organizations and individuals that we are working with, um, we would obviously need to develop, uh, you know, individualized digital security solutions. Um, and then of course uh, comes encryption because that's really the basic, the, the least uh, we can do is to encrypt the data that we are working with along with the communications. Um, yeah, and then again, the uh, more of the basic solutions, including password security. Um, and uh, I, I'm sure that you all might be wondering that, okay, this is re like really basic, we already know this. But believe me when I say this, that when you work with uh, NGOs um, and including activists on the ground, this really is something that can make a, make a huge difference because most people 
I wouldn't even realize how important um, a safe um, password and password security can be. And obviously this is followed by the two-factor authentication. So I think this is, these are some of the really basic things that we can work with, and then we can improvise depending on the projects. Um, this would be me, and I would, I would let the <laughs> other colleagues too. Thank you very much. All right. So uh, I'll introduce you really quickly before. This is Chris Kubeska. She is a IT security professional, a hacker, a cybersecurity researcher, um, and she'll also give her unique challenges and solutions to the case presented. Thanks. Thank you so much. So what I based these on were actual real world examples and things that I've actually used in the past for various reasons. Now, when we're dealing with journalists, you also have to think about the safety of their sources as well, because if there is poor cybersecurity with a journalist or an NGO, and someone uh, perchance is reporting something which is a safety hazard or a human rights violation, that particular source could then be exposed due to poor cybersecurity. So one of the uh, ways that I was posing solutions for this was security is hard. Uh, I'll give you a good example. I have a, a fleece over there that is from the National Security Agency because two years ago I uh, found a, an encryption uh, exploitable vulnerability on NSA servers. So if the NSA has a problem with ensuring proper encryption, journalists and NGOs are also going to have a problem with this type of stuff. So we need to make it easy as much as possible so that they can be used. So one of the things I suggest is a one pager, if not maybe maximum two pager of easy to understand hardening guides and a guide to show the privacy risks as well for using different types of free services because they're going to be used because they're low cost, no cost, and a lot more people know how to use these things than something rather exotic and and uh, proprietary. When you're talking about money, that's a big topic for most people and also organizations, and it's a primary target for, uh, say, your regular run-of-the-mill criminal who's wearing uh, a trench coat and a hat. Uh, one of the things that we can do is actually use secure operating systems like uh, something called TAILS, where anytime there are banking transactions, you use that operating system, and then that operating system does not save any of the settings. It's only used for financial transactions. Uh, when we're dealing with trying to set up uh, good security, one of the things that we can do is look to some of our computer emergency response teams. Now, Luxembourg has this great civilian one called CIRCLE. Uh, it's security with a small Luxembourg is what it stands for. And they have uh, assistance with free training if you happen to be a constituent for Luxembourg. And they'll also uh, place uh, free dummy sensors to look at abnormal uh, behavior and alert on uh, various project networks. In addition to that, they have a hardware project based on a Raspberry Pi where let's say you're a journalist and you receive from a USB a bunch of data from a source and you wanna also make sure that you don't get infected from that source. So this particular project, you plug your USB in and then you plug the source's USB in and it goes ahead and it cleans it and strips away everything including metadata because metadata can be used to actually identify sources. And so it strips that all off and you've got a nice clean piece of data that contains exactly what you want. It even strips it off from images. Uh, one of the things, barring from the corporate world, when I headed information protection group for Saudi Aramco family, is we had a lot of joint ventures that we had to be aware of that they had a much higher risk threat profile, or excuse me, high, much higher risk with their data coming into us uh, versus us where we had lots of money to uh, implement security. So what we did was we treated them as a red or untrusted connection. So in order to get anything into our networks and into our project, they had to go through several layers of security, such as a virus scanner and so forth. Now, another thing to be aware of is when we surf the internet, we can be identified based on our searches, our DNS searches, and also our devices can be fingerprinted using things called a user agent string. Well, there is free technology called Squid, for example, that can uh, mask uh, your user agent string and fingerprinting of your devices, which is a very good alternative in many cases to using, for example, the Tor network because a lot of different governments and police departments around the world actually have exit nodes on the Tor network to try to find the traffic. 
Uh, another thing can be using and leveraging different types of projects like Let's Encrypt to uh, try to set up an automatic encryption system based on, say, Let's Encrypt, which is based in Canada, prior to it being put up into Google Cloud, which could be um, looked at by the U.S. government under the Patriot Act. And they might have to hand over things that you might not want, which could expose sources. Uh, something as simple as virus protection, I have seen lacking with quite a lot of journalists and a huge amount of NGOs. Um, I've even seen it with some government systems. So because the project in the case study has money, uh, virus protection uh, could easily be purchased in bulk for every party that is uh, taking part in this. Now, uh, a separate smartphone uh, for secure communications. Now this is quite important. Uh, earlier this year, uh, my uh, smartphone and secure communications was actually broken into by a nation state because I was working with a journalist to uh, break about uh, my work with uh, negotiating and then getting rid of a particular uh, threat uh, dealing with a, a cell of ISIS. And the particular nation state was not too pleased that things were about to come out and my stuff got hacked, uh, the journalist stuff got hacked. So I took a page from uh, someone that I met who works for the NSA and they've got an actual separate smartphone with no SIM card which can only be turned on for secure communications in a very controlled manner. And this way it's extremely separate and you don't surf the web on it, you don't do banking transactions, it is only for that particular uh, secure communications and that device happens to be encrypted. Now another thing we have to be concerned of is uh, when people are traveling around either to different parts of a particular country or internationally, uh, they're going to want to be able to charge their things, they're going to want to talk about things and do things. So borrowing a page from uh, Saudi Ramco, one of the things we did because uh, several of our corporate officers and on the executive board have actually been assassinated or survived assassinations. And we issued every traveler a travel pack with a uh, mostly pictorial uh, travel information booklet to uh, advise them when you happen to be in a taxi cab. Many of these are recorded with audio and or video, so what you're saying is not private, and be aware of your surroundings. In addition to that, we issued power packs so that they didn't just plug into an airport uh, phone charger, which may or may not be safe. Uh, another thing we did was we issued something called a USB condom, which uh, only allows power transfer and not data transfer at all. And this way, uh, the smartphone might not be infected and bring things back and then expose information. So with that, I will hand over to the next speaker, and thank you very much. Yeah, so next we have Benga Sesan. He is the executive director of the Paradigm Initiative, a digital rights practitioner based in Nigeria, but active in five different partner countries. Benga will also share his unique challenge and solutions. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so uh, it's a one page case study, which made it easy to read. Thank you. Um, and, but, but the first thing that jumped at me when I read this um, was the problem of capacity. Um, and and I, I like the way you described how the funding organization just wants to give money. Uh, I'm sure you, you sense the reaction in the room because uh, it kind of sounds familiar a bit. There, there are people who you know, just want to give money. Uh, but on the other hand, there are people who just want to get the job done. Um, and, and that means that if there's a gap between expectation and the capacity in terms of you know, the reality of what you can do, that is a challenge. Uh, because many times we have conversations between people who uh, are you know, giving resources and people who are getting stuff done on the ground. At the end of the day, you write a report and there's a mismatch. It's typically not because you don't want to get it done. It's mostly at times because the capacity for that particular requirement may not be there. And, and I'll speak to what I think may be a solution uh, in a second. Second is in terms of priority. Um, I think that many times, and you know, I talk a lot about parity mismatch uh, between funding organizations and actors on the ground. There are many times that something is sexy, it's great, it's new, uh, you know, AI, everyone you wants to fund it, 
but is that exactly what the organization on the ground wants to work on? Uh, so there's, there's kind of the question of, is this really what the local partner needs right now? Uh, the interesting thing about this case study is that we are, you know, Paradigm Initiative is setting up a lab that commences in February uh, 2020. Uh, so it kind of is a real uh, experience uh, for me. The interesting thing is we are not talking to a funder, uh, so we don't have that mismatch uh, problem just yet. Uh, the third thing that jumped at me from the case study is this legacy tech versus new tech uh, conundrum. Uh, where an old organization that has been around for 1,005 years, uh, of course that's an exaggeration, uh, believes that this legacy tech that we use is secure and all of that. But a new organization, not, most new organizations don't look for what's best. The first thing is what's available what do we know? What can we use? Of course, as they grow, they you know, get capacity to use more sophisticated things and things like that. Um, but that is a challenge, because you have this legacy tech that you're used to, and this organization has this new cool tool uh, that they uh, have just become aware of. Uh, so uh, solutions, suggestions. Um, and because I know there are experts in the room who can't wait to share their own solutions. So first, first is. If you look at the challenge of capacity, um, I think that we need to begin to think of going just beyond project support, which is, which is typically what most, uh, in this case, so the funding organization wants a learning lab, right? And my suspicion is that the budget that they expect to be presented by this actor on the ground has everything but building technical capacity. Uh, in many cases, things like you know, uh, remission for staff and things like that are not included in, you know, in the project support. Uh, but I think we need to go a bit beyond that. And, and I'm glad that you know, many funders across the world are beginning to think of that, that you're not only thinking of sustainability of the project, but sustainability of the organization itself. Because if the organization dies, then the project is dead. Uh, and and that's, that's the reality. The second is to match available support with demonstrated need. So there are people who really want to build labs. There are people who just want USB condoms. Now, match support with need. Uh, in this case, does this organization in this Global South country, is this lab what exactly they want to work on? If it's not, then I, I guess there's a terrible handshake already. And the only thing that can come from a, a terrible handshake is most likely going to be some form of embarrassment. Uh, and the thought, in terms of you know, legacy versus new tech, is that if this is the platform that you use as an institution that's been working for a while, and this is the platform that the others use, is it possible to have a handshake between both platforms? It's not always possible. I mean, obviously. Um, in an ideal world, everybody expects that every phone charger will work with every other phone, right? Uh, either it's a you know, uh, it's an iPhone or an Android phone, but we know that's not the reality. So the handshake isn't like always, always there. But I think there is a gap between what you use and what I use. Uh, so the question is, what are we gunning for? If what we're gunning for is security, what platform, and I'm saying, for example, if the legacy tech you're using uh, has three main attributes. One, it's secure. Two, it's uh, uh, easy to use. Yeah, that doesn't sound quite legacy. <laughs> and the thought is that it's fast. Then the question to ask is, what is that tool that offers these three properties or these three attributes that is within the range of what you know, new tech solutions offer that this organization uh, can use? And, and I'll draw the curtain on what I'm saying here so uh, I can listen to others. All right, uh, thank you so much. So. Um, yeah, now um, that we got some, some challenges, um, I think I really brought out the, some are individual challenges, organizational challenges, IT security challenges specifically, uh, and on the setup, uh, but then also um, at the end, you know, also project setup challenges, um, and then different solutions. So what we would like to do now is um, get your perspective in, because we know that there are lots of people in the room who um, either have their own experience, uh, work on on these things and their um, own expertise so um, we will now have overall 30 minutes for brainstorming and we'll do this step by step so first round um, to think about what are the best practices do you think should be considered to protect specifically and now we focus on privacy and freedom of expression in this case 
Um, so first find um, a partner um, to do this and discuss this. Um, the cases are um, dispersed. If you need a case, just come um, to the front. Um, but before we start brainstorming, um, and before I set the clock, are there any um, questions of, about the case, like understanding questions um, that you need answering before you can think about this? Then now would be the time to ask them. No? Okay. Just for quick background, we had some different perspectives from the three speakers that we had, but if, if your challenges that need other solutions are from totally different backgrounds, feel free to mention those as well. This is meant to be broad and, and yeah, inclusive. It doesn't need to be strictly from a, tech, a technical or a practitioner background. It can be, you can, you know, be, be creative. Okay, so then, uh, yes, please find a partner and um, brainstorm first on the question, what do you think are best practices that we should consider in this case uh, to protect privacy and freedom of expression? And your neighbor, or you need to move if you don't have a neighbor. Let's go. <laughs>
You got one minute left, one minute in the pair. All right, thank you so far. Please listen to me one second. Um, now, please find a second group. I'm sure you brainstormed lots of best practices. The next challenge for you is, we need the most um, urgent one now. So you meet with another group, share some of the best practices and decide which you think we should definitely urgently implement in this case. Um, and, and nail that one down.
Okay, so last step, everyone. <clears throat> Since you are already um, quite big groups, um, so I would say, yeah, nearly all of them are, yeah, are already uh, nearly eight people, I would say we skip the step of merging again, but I will give you five minutes time now to think about what you would like to present to the others and uh, figure out who would present um, the best practice or the challenge um, you were working on. Um, so you get five minutes.
All right. 
Well, thank you, thank you very much um, for participating already in the group work. We will now finish the group work and uh, for the transcription uh, reasons, um, it's, uh, it's best if one representative or two uh, of your group come actually to the front and uh, present. And the good thing is now we are not pressured on time. So now we have still an easy half an hour um, where you can present your best practice and the other people from the group can um, even raise questions and we can discuss a little bit. So yeah, so thank you for participating in the group work and feeling stressed out a little bit. Um, but <laughs> now we have uh, enough time. So um, looks like the first group here would like to start. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Yes, please, because then the transcription for the online works better. Thank you. Uh, don't take anything I will say for granted, and it's definitely a lie and the worst thing you can do, um, because the time was not much. Um, so uh, in terms of communication within the team, like the first, the first aspect, um, we thought uh, of a lot of things. Uh, we, we certainly agreed that we needed a decentralized uh, a, a, a service that is decentralized that you can set up yourself if needed. So what we in the end came up with because of the broad support and the broad client um, and the broad client choice that you have is use uh, set up an XMPP server, uh, which is basically quite easy to install. And on top of that, use um, uh, off the record encryption and um, to communicate with your, with your partners and, um, and maybe sources. And uh, just a small side note, we agreed that the most crucial thing is integrity of devices. But if you have this, this threat level, then a, a group of 10 people that sat down for a workshop is definitely not the best choice you have. Um, so we refrain from thinking of a solution for that. Thank you. Yes, yes. Uh, could, you, uh, could you also, yeah, I'll bring you a mic. Yes. So uh, you talk about we as in external or internal? Are you the organization or are you supporting them? And how good do you know the organization? Uh, I, would, I would actually uh, think, uh, I would actually, as we, I would consider the organization itself, not, uh, not the external, like we, the organization. You would need some technical knowledge for that, but it's, a techni it's technical knowledge that is uh, easily acquired and is really easy to install there. There are truckloads of uh, tutorials on how to do that. Okay, thank you. Um, any more questions on this? Okay, then, um, yes, thank you. Very good ideas. Um, very technical. <laughs> I, I need to look up uh, one, one thing afterwards <laughs> again. So um, now this group, please. Yeah, hello. So I'm rep representing the group. In case I move left, you bring me back right, please. <laughs> oh, actually, what would be great is if you can say your name and your organization, because then we also get to know each other. Sorry, okay. I forgot that. Okay, my name is Sade Malunfashi. I'm a fellow of the Reporters Without Borders Germany Berlin Scholarship Program. I'm an, a freelance journalist. Um, so for our scenario, we considered basically four things, which I will mention first, then I will go into the details of what we discussed for it. So we thought of having these four key points, um, basically a threat modeling scenario for the funded organization in case in determining what's actually the threat scenario which was mentioned. And then we considered the following four aspects, uh, basically account security, encryption, and anonymization. Yeah, we decided to go through first after the, doing the threat modeling to go 
what we call a safe tech audit, um, to visit the organization, check their internet setup, and improve its security, basically. For devices, we considered um, looking at software updates, ma making sure that all the devices can be um, uh, up to date in terms of software licenses and checking for malware. Also make a safe policy, make safe internet policy use for the organization and make sure that it's enforced for all staff. Then train the staff on digital security awareness. Um, in terms of encryption, we ad will advise the use of end-to-end -end communi uh, encryption communication apps or tools for communication within the organization. Also encrypting data at rest and in transit. Then using anonymity tools for research and browsing, especially Tor, and providing VPN access to all employees. And then finally, in terms of uh, for the bank account security, um, um, if it's just to protect the, the organization's bank account from basically criminal hackers, we advise using tails for sensitive information. And okay, one thing I forgot to mention for account security also to ensure the use of two-factor authentication for all online accounts. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, questions or, or feedback to those measures? Okay, thank you so much. Um, now I would say, yeah, the group over there. I was voluntold to present. <laughs> uh, I'm Karen Riley. I'm with Status 404 right now, um, and I've written a lot of grants for some of the tools that get mentioned here. Um, we focused a lot on, on processes, uh, so basically starting out with a threat modeling, adversary modeling to understand you know, who exactly you're protecting things against um, and what sort of jurisdictions that you're worried about. Um, maybe with help, you know, organizations that do uh, security audits, um, you know, particularly NGOs like Internews and others um, that have a framework for evaluating um, a small NGO's security stance. Um, and doing the, the low effort, high impact mitigations, uh, basically things that everyday citizens should be doing for their own digital security, things like two-factor authentication, um, good password management, uh, whether, you know, not recycling any passwords if people do nothing else, sometimes that helps, uh, particularly with the threat of the low-level um, uh, criminal organizations that should forestall a lot of those things. Um, in terms of device security, um, that would be, particularly if you're doing human rights work where you have to, say, go to a prison and hand your uh, mobile device over to the security system, uh, security services of a company, and so that phone is going to be with them for an hour, so they can do who knows what with it. That shouldn't be your primary device. Um, along those lines, um, there there will always be people that are less technically adept at organizations, um, and so compartmentalization and access control for organizations. Not everybody needs access to everything. Um, also. Uh, open source and usable tech, if there are alternatives to big platforms um, that are usable, which means that people won't be uh, you know, using a WhatsApp group on the side or something like that because your Mattermost is not configured uh, correctly. Um, and then also, particularly with the freelance case, a lot of NGOs, a freelancer comes, sets something up, doesn't document it, and so then you have data who knows where uh, and uh, maybe it get lost, maybe you don't have access to it. Um, and so to do a little bit of project management, everybody who comes on and does tech stuff will document it with the use case that, it, that will have to hand it over to somebody else. And also, uh, if you're going to outsource things, if you're going to put things in the cloud, you should be aware of the data processing agreements so that you know if there's copies of sensitive data on devices that you don't control. I, I think that was... It. Okay. Good. Thank you. Any uh, any questions there? Very you? Yes, very thorough. <laughs> I think we're going to put together a very good guide um, after this. Oh, um, so the next group, I think, there's one in the very back. Yes, and then.
So, okay, I'm Christoph, I'm here on my own. And uh, we put some good things together. We already have heard here some. Uh, but uh, what we um, also mentioned is uh, training for the people we are um, working with. Uh, so we, uh, they know how to deal with open source softwares that are around and uh, to spread the skills they have um, a little bit so that when somebody is not available for some things to do, you not have to wait to update your server for the next f five days or something like this, that there is somebody else who jumps in and does it. Um, we were also considering splitting the functions of the devices as we already heard in the, um, in the lecture that you have got a device for one function and another device for next function. Yeah, that's it, I think. Okay, thank you. Any comments and questions? Okay, and then last but not least, there's a group over there. Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, I just w uh, want to share my best practice for uh, our, our academic uh, experience that uh, we are working on GIS mapping uh, for water treatment and there are so many phishing and cyber crime on the uh, database but we practiced uh, to uh, structure VPN model that's just uh, uh, verified people through VPN access to this database and uh, the, th uh, uh, the second level of security is that uh, the uh, user should be uh, verified with uh, email address. They receive the uh, on, um, on a specific code uh, via email and the observer can check is that true with the correct uh, code that uh, monitor uh, for uh, water treatment or not, you know that it's a strategic uh, and uh, there are so many problems about that. So uh, our best practice VPN, uh, second a level of uh, a verification code and uh, just a live observer that check that is that correct user and uh, 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 editor just uh, have uh, access to database or not. There are so many phishing about that, especially for a strategic uh, practice. Yep. Uh, what VPN services do you use? Uh, VPN services that uh, uh, verified with academic institutions. Uh, yes. Yes, with Cisco system. Cisco system. That it's updated uh, uh, just uh, one year ago. Uh, there are so many gaps. Uh, last uh, just uh, uh, one year ago, but uh, no, uh, we have the some uh, problem uh, for compatibility of the uh, sec uh, first level of security and uh, uh, second level of security. Uh, but uh, well, we did it. Okay. Yep. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Father. Um, yeah. Um, first of all, I like this discussion here. Really, I really appreciate it. Uh, my name is Maurice, and uh, we discussed a little bit um, about um, best practices on how um, to work together. Is it email and uh, yeah, um, privacy uh, with email, or is it um, agile working and so on? And so we discussed uh, the problems um, if um, data is server-based or if it is cloud-based, and if it is cl is cloud close ba cloud based, um, it's more critical because uh, if someone wants to steal the data, everything is on one place and that's not good for, um, for the um, security infrastructure. Um, but the main uh, part was that it's always um, important to give a secure um, condition on learning and on intercultural um, aspects because everyone has to deal with new uh, challenges uh, concerning software and so on. And it's always important uh, that uh, there's enough um, resource on um, yeah, learning capacities and on, uh, to make mistakes and um, to give the possibilities to learn together because if the team doesn't learn together then it's not um, possible to uh, save um, the privacy and the freedom of uh, expression. Thank you. 
Thank you so much. Um, so yeah, we were, we were busy writing here because I think this is a really good guide and will definitely provide a thorough uh, documentation of all your uh, results as well um, afterwards. It will be linked on the, um, on the workshop afterwards. Since we still have 10 minutes, um, please uh, have now, you know, I will ask uh, for feedback now here from, from um, our experts here on stage, and then I will turn it back to you as well for like final comments and thoughts um, that, uh, that you have um, after uh, this workshop. So for you, um, Daniel, but also um, Benga um, and uh, Farhan um, and Chris, since you have sometimes you know, been on the ground. What do you think about some of the um, solutions and best practices? How reality fit are there? Or are there actually other things that we might have not um, touched upon yet that are really vital to even implement um, any of these really you know, good IT security and digital security solutions? Um, so I will um, start over here with Daniel, and then maybe let's do a round. Yeah, uh, no, uh, as, as you said, it's, um, it's a great toolbox, uh, let me put it that way. Um, and I can only say from my trainer perspective, working with people, um, mostly the crucial point is not that much the technology itself, because we do have plenty of secure technology out there. Um, the question is, do people want to use it? Um, and I was very thankful, uh, especially about the last point, like about like also this intercultural uh, learnings. Uh, I cannot stress enough how much I learned when we, for that um, threat modeling guide, when we did workshops in um, countries I've honestly never been to um, before, like Ghana, Uganda, and I really like just seek input and just realize that, okay, Daniel, this European perspective just does not fit. And if, for example, the company I'm uh, consulting at the moment, DW Academy, if they really want to make a difference in the digital security, they have to, um, yeah, there, there needs to be a common understanding uh, between these cultural gaps that do exist. Um, and I think, yeah, this is apart from all the technology uh, mentioned here, which are all um, good, um, yeah, they are just, this is the most crucial point. Just one example, like if I hear Tor browser, yeah, of course, no debate that this is, uh, might, might be better than have not using Tor browser, but it's just a matter of fact that no one really uses it in, in, in certain countries at least. Um, so we have to think about, okay, what are the mechanism, what are the processes to, to change this? Okay, thank you. Farhan? Um, so I, um, one of the one of the suggestions I think it was by the second group was that um, we should also um, make sure that uh, and because we also have money for it, um, uh, hopefully the the donors have money for it. Is that the devices and the software? Um, because I now that I think of it, like there's a really really big issue of uh, using pirated software. It's quite common because nobody, like not many people, can afford um, licensed operating systems. And really, what can you do when you don't even have um, uh, a licensed operating system? And when the one that you are using is downloaded off of an internet, and God only knows what uh, it brings with it. So I think yeah, um, if you can, uh, if you can, then this is really the basic, and uh, like you should uh, help them with the, with the licensed software um, and devices, uh, and really emphasize the the need for it. And I, I really quite liked um, this feedback, along with uh, what everybody else um, from the audience said. It, it was very relevant. Um, and I, I see that um, um, being used in in in, in the context. Um, of what I, I talked about. So, yeah, I think it was a good suggestion. Thank you, Chris. Uh, so one of the groups discussed uh, doing an audit and seeing uh, what sort of weaknesses and vulnerabilities might exist and then trying to correct those. It's also important to consider uh, continually doing those audits at least once a year if possible. Uh, in addition to that, uh, another group mentioned using VPN hardware. It's very important to audit the configuration of that hardware 
uh, because one of the things that I find, the internet always yields loveliness for me because I do identify as a hacker. And one of the things that the internet yields a lot are VPN systems, even Cisco systems, that they were just put in, but they weren't configured properly. So uh, I won't mention the political party from the US, uh, but I found that uh, they had never turned on encryption or authentication on their VPN system, which means it's not a VPN system, right? So uh, you have to be aware of those things. You also have to be aware that the hardware itself is going to need to be updated. So if you have a Cisco or whatever version, you actually have to uh, still keep updating those particular things. And another thing that I find a whole bunch of times is this is on email systems or uh, security appliances like a VPN or so forth is they might have encryption turned on but they're using what's called a vendor demo certificate which means uh, for example up until at least uh, this April I found that the Saudi Ministry of Foreign Affairs which is their intelligence arm was using a Cisco demo certificate uh, on their email system that was supposedly secure, and that means a whole bunch of different devices are using the same one, and I find this all the time. So I, I make a joke in um, my uh, last uh, book, if anybody wonders how uh, Turkish intelligence could so easily figure out the moves of Saudi intelligence when it came to Khashoggi, well, their the Saudi Ministry of Foreign Affairs entire email system was assumed secure, but it absolutely was not. So pay attention to these different things. Um, another thing, be aware, I told uh, this group over here, when we're dealing with the uh, Tor browser, uh, sometimes it's not the best thing to use because you have to take into account a few different things. Uh, will you look like uh, a blip, an, anonym, an, uh, an anomaly that, say, an access provider like an ISP might see you and then try to track uh, what's going on. Another thing to consider is if you have something called JavaScript enabled in that Tor browser, I can hook uh, that Tor browser uh, using a very simple tool called Beef, uh, which is in Kali, but that's uh, something that uh, is actually now more and more commonplace. For example, uh, one of the ways that the NSO group were able to hack into brand new updated iPhones is because the Safari browser runs JavaScript by default and uh, it's very difficult to turn off. So be aware of these different things when you're using stuff. Um, to effectively use Tor, you also can't, uh, you have to read the warnings and make sure you don't make your screen full size because all of a sudden that telemetry data uh, can then be broadcast and then it can fingerprint your exact system. So there are some inherent risks to using some of these things um, that everyone needs to be a bit more aware of and uh, not to automatically have certain assumptions. Thank you. Oh. Well, did you go too deep for a normal one? Yes. <laughs> oh, sorry. <laughs> Thank you, Chris. <laughs> Okay, uh, so I, one, of, one of the things I appreciate about sessions like this is that we move from the paradigm of solutions looking for problems to solve, which is typically what we do. You know, we have this tech solution and then we're like, which problem needs us? Uh, but we've kind of, yeah, I mean, that's what we do naturally, but we've kind of turned it on its head. These are the problems. What solutions do we need? Uh, so the only thing I want to say we is... We did this or we didn't do this? We did this okay, here. Okay, good. Yeah, that's, that's what was done here. And I want to just encourage that, please, let's take this on. It shouldn't just be a workshop 159 thing. It should be our daily daily model, uh, because I, I find that the reason why, uh, for example, it, there's some countries that we work in where there have been proposed security solutions and people use them and get picked up because it was a solution that was looking for a problem and there was no context in terms of its interpretation, in terms of it use, its use. So I, I would encourage that we use the same model uh, when we're developing things around security and things like that to make sure that we know what the problem is the available tools and what solves the problem. Not, hey, there's this solution, what problem needs us. All right, thank you. So we have uh, two minutes left, and um, if any of you guys would like to give either feedback or comment, things that pop to your head you really wanna um, 
yeah, say now, um, now would be the time. <laughs> All right, well then, uh, yeah. Uh, hi everyone. Uh, Farhan was talking about uh, uh, organization giving away money. I would like a, like a list of that organization. <laughs> yeah. So my question uh, is to I you uh, done, yeah. regarding yes, uh, uh, regarding uh, choosing a good VPN uh, service providers because they have been advising us that we stay away from the 14 eyes nations. What's your take on that? Stay away from the 14 eyes nation. <laughs> I don't care what they say about not logging. I know uh, because sometimes I work uh, various cases helping out uh, the police look for uh, some very serious uh, like terrorism organizations and stuff. And I have, all, I have seen time and time again any VPN provider affiliated with the 14 uh, eyes nations have always kept logs and have sung like birds. All right, any other comments or questions? All right, well then we are very um, German-like and finish on time, even a little bit too early. Um, I thank you all for participating and uh, really you know, giving us uh, your all. Um, and yeah, as I said, the guide, the toolbox, uh, will be published um, the, under the report section from this workshop that will be up. Um, so yeah, thank you.